Finally, Holly. Um, Holly Batchelor is a student at St. Andrews University. You will know, because I think there are a few, few people from the BA out there, won top prize at the BA Crest Science Fair, represented the UK in science at the 2007 Intel International Science and Engineering Fair in New Mexico. I only mention that mouthful because amongst 1,511 other scientists, she left America with an internship there. First place in physics and astronomy, but here comes the killer line. And I'm sorry, John and Paul. She is the only person on this panel who has had a near-Earth asteroid named after her. <laughs> and in case uh, Lord Rees would like to check the reference on that one, it is called, Martin, Minor Planet 23248 Bachelor. So, uh, Holly, I, I guess the obvious question to you is, you're a person who came out of our school system inspired by science and went into the world of, of science inspiring others. So what was it that, that inspired you? It was straight off getting some hands-on experience that I didn't really get at school. Um, it was going off and doing this <coughs> research project by myself with the aid of our Nuffield Foundation bursary. And it allowed me to really see how science is applied in the real world, not just as equations in a textbook. And it also, as you say, it allowed me to meet so many inspiring people and work with them as well. So what I'd really like to kind of get across is just the fact that I think more and more young people who maybe don't see science as being interesting or being cool can go out and do this work by themselves, can go out and find, find out some more about science and really see the bigger picture of how science um, is applied in the real world. John, before we go to the audience, there's a recurring theme there, isn't there, between John and Holly about that sense of independence, the new skills, the sense of excitement. I remember Paul Drayson came to Nesta once and spoke about the sense of fear that becomes such a motivating element of being engaged with the business of science and technology. And I guess your real challenge is about how to build a set of skills which develops that. Is that right? Yes, it is. And I was just coming back on Holly's point. I, 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 what's the th I was fine when people talk about that, is when I made my own transition from doing a science degree to doing a PhD, I realised that I'd actually managed to get a science degree without ever imagining I might discover anything. Yeah. So as a scientist, but I'd never thought I'd be in the process of discovery. And that's a failing of science education works like that. Actually, I didn't discover anything, which is why I'm in politics. <laughs> um, but that's a, <laughs> that, 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 and I thought, no. The, the more serious part of the, So that is a serious issue about how we do our science education, the ability to be exposed to actually mm. doing something. But there's also a broader point here, which is I get asked at least once a week by somebody usually in the higher education press, are we sacrificing education in the chase for employability? And yet when you talk to people who've needed a set of skills to use what they've learned in education, like science, the set of skills that people need, <laughs> the ability to think creatively, to apply what they know to a new situation, to be reflective, to inquire, is actually what we mean by employability. So it's actually a rounded education. Now, I think what we're looking at a lot at the moment in the higher education system in particular is how can we get more of those elements back into the education that takes place. A lot of people in scientifically orientated business are talking about internships. We had a big splash of publicity recently about internships for this summer, but it's a much more general idea. Is does your education give you the ability to see your learning in the real world and know how you use it? We've also got this big movement of, graduate, of, of undergraduate entrepreneur clubs. Most universities now have some sort of network of entrepreneurial opportunities often linking up to the broader finance community. And I think that change of, uh, or that development of education, not to say that everybody's got to do these things, but to extend the range of opportunities for young scientists to understand how their science can be used by them and by others in concept is something we've got to do more of. Right. Paul, uh, I, I, can't, I can't resist asking you this, because I know many people want to. Picking up from Richard's comment about the role that capital played in commercialising a great idea, you're a man who commercialised incredibly successfully an extraordinary idea. W what are your recollections of those initial ingredients of turning a great idea into a commercial success? Well, there was a, a real resonance from what Rich was saying. In the, in the early days, what you want is to have the ability to take the personal risk to actually come out of you know, the safe environment of either a company you may be working for or the academic environment. And to do that, you need a relatively small amount of, of money, but you, 
you, you to actually work up your, your idea and an environment where a team of people can get together and they can get some feedback to give them some validation that there, there will be a market for it. And this is where the government can have a very important role in putting in place the mechanisms whereby some very early stage seed funding for something at the point of coming out of the university or actually and particularly in difficult times, looking at whether or not there is a need for a, a structure to actually address a, a serious market failure problem. Now, in my own particular case, in the 1980s, when after coming out of my PhD, I was um, building up a, uh, a, new, a new company, the fact that there was 3I, which the history of 3I, 3I was, was founded just after the Second World War to help the, in the rebuilding of Britain after that war, and at that stage in the 80s, 3i was investing all over the country in terms of small amounts of development and venture capital. Unfortunately, 3i went public and has exited that market. Uh, we have a strong venture capital industry in the country at the moment, but unfortunately, that industry is really struggling because of the economic downturn. We need to find ways of making sure that the real need that a tremendously strong science base has now. As the Prime Minister and John have said, you know, we've invested in the science base. I've been told by the venture capitalists that the propositions that are being put forward to them have never been stronger, the strongest they've seen for 30 years, just at a time when there's a real shortage of capital. Now, uh, Nestor, your own organisation, has put forward some really good ideas about how we could address this. This is something which we're taking very seriously. Great. Thank you. I think that's a, it's a brilliant start because it, it, the, the spread of responses so far, you know, for, for John Hilton, new skill, innovation flourishes <coughs> when new skills work in very independent ways. For Richard Woods, that critical first moment of confidence <coughs> that capital can build. For Holly, it's about engaging with real world problems. And then as far as the Secretary of State and the Minister are concerned, it's the appetite that government now has to look for new and ingenious ways to intervene, to stimulate the university capacities of this country, and you sense that there is an appetite to do that with urgency, but to do that in a very thoughtful way.